Great. Welcome again to the new Infworks 360 in Civil 3D Workflows. Uh, I am James Wedding. I'm a Senior Technical Specialist with Autodesk. And today we're going to look at a lot of different things. We're going to really look at some of my favorite toys uh, within both applications. We're going to look at how these things are better together, really in a chocolate and peanut butter sort of way. So we do these webcasts twice a month. Uh, the product team, typically Eric Chappelle and his buddies, are here to help out on the first and third Wednesday. Uh, I have recruited a couple of guys from my former team. So the Bartles brothers uh, uh, got drafted in the background, and they will be sort of watching the question and answer poll for me. And if they see something come up, hopefully they will ping me over on Skype and let me know. But the goals of this are really to look at features and areas of the product that maybe you don't think about. We do a lot of webinars. We look at a lot of sales presentations. You look at a lot of marketing presentations. And really, this is designed to go beyond that. Look at really some practical application of the tool set. And today, for me especially, it's going to be really uh, looking at some pieces we have put together during our Day in the Life YouTube videos. I worked with John Sayre and Eric over the past few months to put together, I think, eight or nine YouTube videos that really emphasize daily tasks where Infoworks plus Civil 3D is just so much better than trying to do something in Civil 3D by and of itself. Now, the next webcast, we're going to drag in my buddy Nick Zeben from uh, the product team and Nigel Peters, and they're really going to look at the latest roadway features. If you didn't uh, notice, I posted a couple of things up on Twitter. You know, look at that. There's a left turn lane. Now, yeah, we should have had left turn lanes a little while back, but hey, we've got them now. We've got a lot of great things going on on the roadway design elements, and that seminar will be on March 23rd. Go ahead and order Jason's now. We'll get you set up for lunch, and Nick and Nigel will jump in and get you through all of the latest roadway features. Now, before we get started, we do need to run a quick poll, so let me make sure that is what's next on our agenda. It sure is, so I'm going to fire up this poll, and you guys should see a poll open. And really, this is what is your current usage level with InfoWorks 360? And you know, how are you using it? Looks like, oh, we've got a horse race going with the installed and played with it. And I've dabbled in on a few projects. Guys, this is the webinar for you. This is the, you know, where can I use InfoWorks 360 to impact the stuff I do all the time? Where am I better off trying to maybe use InfoWorks 360 instead of my traditional tool set, whether that be a Sharpie on an onion skin or if that is a Photoshop or, you know, some other piece of software that we use. This is the, the, the piece of the seminar we want to look at today. For those of you who made the transition like me from land desktop to civil 3D, maybe you remember Angel Espinoza's seminars, uh, Civil 3D on a Dime, where he really went after how can I use civil 3D to impact the things I do every day? And, and what areas can I use the tools that really doesn't require a whole lot of training or a whole lot of deep dive, but I can just take advantage of the tool set? That's what we're going to try and look at today. All right, so let's close that poll. Looks like we've got about, oh, a solid three quarters uh, have Inforks in some way, shape, or form. And then, you know, we've got the experts on the, I use it on every project, and I could probably run this webinar. And then we've got a few folks like, I don't even have it installed. I just know if I showed up in the conference room for this webinar, the boss said I could order pizza. All right, let's go ahead and close that poll. And we're going to move into... The topic at hand. Oh, wait, first, we've got to emphasize the community. Eric is our evangelist to make sure that we emphasize the community. This is the community main page. And remember, it's not just autodesk.com slash Inforks360. That will get you the product page. That'll get you the trials. That'll get you the download. That'll get you all the sort of Autodesk product information. But autodesk.com slash Inforks360 community, all one word, all one space. This is where we really come together as 
users and developers and support folks and just, to be honest, infrastructure geeks. And we get to look and explore and play. And you can see both the recorded webcast, you can be notified of the next webcast, and you can show off your work, right? And this is where we've got things like the Idea Station as well as the new Learning tab. This really taps into the Autodesk Knowledge Network. Over the last, oh, nine months or so, we really looked at what can we do to make getting up to speed easier. We've put together a lot of YouTube videos. We've put together a lot of uh, just, just tips and tricks and tutorials and step-by-step -step process, and we've tried to bring it all together on this learning tab right inside the community where you'll see great stuff from Eric and John and Jeff and Jerry and George and Angel and Steve. You know, all these guys that you are familiar with and you've seen their classes online, you've seen them presented at you, you know, your peers, it's all part of this community. It's not just us, it's you. So if you've got a great tip, jump up on that community and share it. Now, here is our safe harbor statement. This um, lets us talk a little bit more freely about where Infox 360 is, where Infox 360 is going. And this is also known as the, if I say something and it doesn't show up in the next release, you can't sue me statement. So uh, this is our legal discussion. Uh, please don't make a purchasing decision based on what you see today. Uh, make a purchasing decision based on what your company does and knowing that you can do some incredible things with Infox and 360 together. So these are some forward-looking statements may show up and uh, we're not legally obligated. All right, ask a lot of questions. Uh, you're still looking at the poll? Really? Go to webinar, uh, only chat window. Okay, for those guys, um, are you guys seeing the poll on your screen right now or are we seeing the ask questions pane? Okay, all right, that's good. Uh, let me work on my staff real quick here to make sure these guys can answer questions. I'm gonna make you guys organizers real quickly and that should give you access to that pane. And by the way, Jerry and Jeff, thanks for letting me draft you in. Hopefully this will, uh, take care of that. All right, we do have over 150 folks on the call, so we're not going to open the phone lines, but the questions pane should be open. The chat pane is open, so if something comes up, if something isn't clear, by all means, fire away. So what are we talking about when we talk about Infox 360 and Civil 3D workflows? We're talking about chocolate and peanut butter here. I like chocolate. I like peanut butter. I'm a crunchy fan, but really, I really like dark chocolate peanut butter cups. That's what I'm about. So I always uh, hear this phrase, and this is um, give a boy a hammer and everything he meets has to be pounded. Now, I've heard it as when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You know, if, if I, uh, you know, the, the, the reverse version, when you feel like a nail, everybody else looks to be pounding on your head. You know, and I went and looked it up and I found this Kaplan's Law of the Instrument. Uh, and this is the first place I found it sourced. But this to me really speaks to the, you know what, I'm an expert in Civil 3D, so therefore I'm going to do everything in Civil 3D. Now I will say, this is the corollary I learned out on Habitat for Humanity sites, and you know, if that hammer doesn't solve it, get a bigger hammer, because a 15 pound sledge will solve 90% of the problems. But it doesn't solve them all, and it's really an inefficient way to do a lot of, lot of things. So today, we're really going to look at using the right tool for the job. If I'm trying to cut out a window hole, I'm going to use a saw. Yeah, I could break the window hole out of the plywood with hammers, and I could chip away at it with the back of the claw, but man, that's an ugly way to get the job done. We really want to talk about use the right tool for the job, and that's where we talk about bringing these things together and how we're looking at different options and different workflows. So here's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at how we pull in existing conditions and generate contours, because this is a question that came up a lot. Uh, last year, I was part of the Infox 360 sales team, 
and I visited, oh, let me see what was the last number. Um, I visited with almost 150 customers last year, both in person and virtually. And I would say about a quarter of the time, the question came up of, how I want to show contours in Infoworks, right? We're familiar with contours. People get contours. So we're going to show, I'm going to show you the way to get existing contours into Infoworks. It's sort of a cool trick, but we're going to use the right tool for the right job. We're going to look at drainage and expanded areas. One of the things that I find a lot when I am uh, first working with people on Infoworx is that they go and they use the model builder tool and it's awesome, but they just grab their site. They don't grab context. And then they're uh, a couple days in, they're a couple weeks into the job and they go, oh man, I've done all this work in this model and I need to expand the model area. I need to get more information to do my hydrology. How can I do this? And we're going to look at using the right tool for the job. And we're going to look at how you can expand a model. We're going to look at corridors and coverages. We're going to look at what parts of the civil 3D design file do I really want to use when I'm trying to communicate that design. When I'm trying to tell my grandmother what this new subdivision is going to look like, what parts of the civil 3D model do I want to show in Infoworks? And how do I do that best? And then last, we're going to look at a couple of quick tricks for working with animations and movies inside of Infoworks. And actually, we're going to look at how we can use PowerPoint to communicate Infoworks models uh, really very clearly, effectively, and cheaply. So let's get into it. Let's take a look at the demonstration. Let me close this down. Or actually, just... Uh, Let's see if I can just alt tab my way across to Infoworks. And there we are. First thing we're going to look at, how do we get contours into Infoworks? So great tool set, lots of information available. This is the Apple Springs development. And this is a development that John Sayer uh, worked on when he was in practice. And he's let us borrow it to show off a little bit. And yeah, the subdivision's there, it's in the photo, but we're gonna look at sort of the construction process. So let's look at how we can use civil 3D information to get contours in here. So the first thing we're going to look at is a couple of options we have right from the get-go. And this is probably one of my favorite ones is just looking at simple terrain themes. And I gotta minimize some things here. Just to start with, you can always use the terrain theme on elevation and if you use the palette type of AutoCAD palette, right, you'll see that it divides up pretty equally. And you get this um, sort of crazy rainbow of fruity flavors. And they're really not contours per se. But the way this, that, that the AutoCAD palette goes through the process, well, let's set up, let's up that transparency a little bit so it's not quite so acid. Um, Oh, let's go right about there, right? That really lets me see flow. And when we're talking about just sort of general flow, that's pretty good, right? It's, it's a good starting point. It takes 15 seconds. Just turn on that terrain theme. And what I find nine times out of 10, and let's delete this because I want to show you really the difference here, is when we turn on that terrain theme, when we just do the, the default palette type, you get this. And it's, it's not bad. But it's not great. So if we edit that and go with a little more stylistic, you can see different options by playing with different palettes. Um, and the US, USGS one isn't bad, but I don't find it has enough ramps to really get that feel of contours, to get that feel of flow. And yeah, it's a little bit crazy, but when you use that AutoCAD palette, just because of the way AutoCAD did uh, the variations in colors, you know, on that cycling scale, you get really a very cool, a very effective stepping, very contour-like appearance. So there's option number one. If you need it in two seconds, fire up your, trans uh, your elevation theme and use the AutoCAD palette. You'll get something that looks pretty good. All right, now what if you need something Better. What if you need something a little more realistic, or what if you need to show the existing ground survey? Well, first off, let's go ahead and bring in the existing ground survey. So I have that survey, 
And I've done a couple of things that are a little bit um, different than I normally would if I was just using Civil 3D by itself. And, and really, this gets into the idea of how you break up projects. So I'm looking at my Civil 3D topo now. And what I'm looking at, though, is a file. And you can do this with other things. Um, I find that isolating components that I'm interested in from an import perspective makes it a lot easier to control, manipulate, and update things. So if we take a look at the tool space setup for this file, what you'll find is that this is nothing, absolutely nothing, but a data shortcut to my EG from my survey file. Now that survey file has got all the points, it's got labels, it's got power poles, it's got a thousand things in it. It's probably got alignments. It's got parsing. For me, I just want to grab the topo. So I create this file. I data shortcut in the surface. And I set the contours to an interval that I want to display down the line in Inforks. Now, that file's created. So let's bring it over. And I am digging into my project here. So here's my, just so you can see, and let's... Uh, no, no smoke and mirrors in this webcast. This is all real, real time, right? So there's my Xtopo DWG. Drag and drop that in, and we just want the Civil 3D DWG. Now, the only thing I'm going to do here, and you'll notice now, this is a lot easier than sometimes dealing with, you know, the stack of temporary files that we get, or the uh, working surfaces that we sometimes get. I just have the EG from Survey. So I bring that in. I'm going to hit close and refresh because I want it to go ahead and process that surface. That's the only thing I'm getting. And now you can see I've got a surveyed surface, right? You can see um, the contours are typical surveyed contours. Now, if we turn off the analysis and we zoom in here, you'll see sort of the rough areas. We've got some low points back in this creek area. It's, it's just working with the... Topo. Now, to make it a little bit clearer, I'm going to go ahead and also bring in a shape file from that meets and bounds. And we're just going to bring this in so we can cover up this area. Now, here's your other nickel tip. For those of you who are already using Civil 3D, using, uh, sorry, using Inforx 360, one of the things you'll find in the coverage areas is that we default to this collection of styles. We got this really, and this is sort of the one that everybody just defaults to using, right? It's it's a grass with a gravel border. It basically colors everything green. It puts a border around it. Eh, that's pretty nifty. But if you go to the material tab, if you go to the terrain collection, you'll find one called field. And all of the materials in this terrain collection are... Um, Scaleless. Uh, there's a there's a more official term. They they work at scale. They don't tile. They look good at different scales. So I'm going to use the field, and then close and refresh. And now you'll see it doesn't quite have that. It still textures up. But as as I zoom in, you'll see that it begins to replicate. And if I get all the way down to you know a bug's life scale. You can see I get individual blades of grass. I don't get that weird pixelated texture. So if you're looking at large areas, grass, gravel, uh, fields, whatever, try using that material palette of styles instead of just the coverages. You'll get a little bit better visual fidelity. So now we have our terrain. It comes in. We still have the low points. We still don't have contours. How are we going to get contours? Well, we go back to Civil 3D and we use the right tool for the job. So in Civil 3D, I've got contours and I want to bring them across. If I bring them across or I try to bring them across right now as a DWG, we, we get DWG elements. We don't get the contours. We don't get those pieces. What we need is to take advantage of the new terrain overlay feature in Inforx 360 uh, release 4 of the 2016 edition. So what that means is I'm going to create a image of my contours and then I'm going to drape it on the ground in Inforx. So let's look at how we do that. 
first thing you got to do, it's all about the raster. We have to create a raster image out of our terrain. So we go to the raster tools. This is part of the raster design tool set. It's part of the Infor-X, excuse me, infrastructure design suite. So you got to have a suite. You got to have a full toolbox to do this stuff. I'm going to create a new image and I my eyes are going bad so I always have to pause here. All right, so we create a new blank image. It's going to fire up raster. Hopefully my licensing kicks in. Cool. No problems. And then I'm going to set to true color so that I get a ping and then I have to pick where is this image. So I use the pick button, I zoom out a little bit, and I go right here. Well, rotation, zero, and then I just draw a box around my site. Now, you can sit here and monkey with uh, different scales, different pixels, different densities. It's up to you. The bigger you make this uh, resolution, the bigger you take these, these issues, the more it will make that file larger. All right, so there's a question. Wow. All right. Um, I cannot actually keep this open and do anything. So, Jerry, if you see one that I need to pop up, um, you know, make sure we pop it over on Skype. Thanks. All right, let me close that down. All right, so here's our new image dialog. All this is doing is creating an empty image frame. It's not putting anything in the image. It's just saying to AutoCAD, hey, we're going to make an image here. Give it this area. Give it this size. Give it this pixel density. Now I have to populate that image. And to do that, if we just try and pick the surface, you won't get anything. So we have to pull the contours out. Now, I'm a big pick first guy, so I grab the surface. I go to my extract from surface, extract objects, and I select major and minor contours and click OK. Now, what that has done is I've created a series of polylines. So I've got a stack of polylines. Now, I go to back to my raster tool set. I'm going to go into the edit area and merge vector. So with merge vector, you have to pick an image, and then you have to pick the stuff you want in the image. I pick my image box, and then I select my contours. Now, I'm going to go ahead and zoom in here. I'm going to hit remove and pull out that border just in case anything got, because uh, I don't actually want the surface. I just want the contour lines and press enter and then I'm going to go ahead and delete those vector entities because I don't want a bunch of polylines hanging around on top of my contours right that just leads to duplicate data so I'll go ahead and delete that and there we go now what I have is a polyline uh, or I have a surface but I also now have an image at this point, it's just a raster image. I haven't told it what kind of format or anything else. I have an image that contains my contours. Straightforward. Now, to take this out, I go ahead and take my image export command. So back on the raster tool palette, image export. I'm going to change this to ping. I like pings. And you can see there I've got my ping. So let's go 11 web 2 just in case I don't get this right. And then I just use the normal encoding method, and then I select world file. This is the important part of this, right? When I use this world file, that's going to tell Inforx where is this image. That's going to tell Inforx how big is this image, what's the scale, how does this lay on to the real world. And then I click finish. And what you should get is something that looks like this. And you can see right down here, I've got a EG topo. There's the ping. Um, and there's my web ping, right? So there's a ping and there's a PGW. PGW is the world file for that ping. Now, move this out of the way. Let's go back to my Inforx model and simply drag and drop that ping image 
right on top of my design. Now, I do have to tell it what coordinate system to assign. Close and refresh. And if all goes well, there we go, right? So now I've got a white box, but if we zoom in, you'll see I get the contours. Great, but not quite done. Now I go to my data sources tab. I pick my ping image. And on the raster tab, I'm going to use the color mask option over here on the right. And I'm not even going to try, I think I could just pick white, but I'm going to use pick screen color, pick a white dot. And if all goes well, boom, contours inside of Inforks 360. Now, I can't do that right now without using both tools, right? This is a workflow I really need to use the entire tool set. I couldn't do this, to be honest, I couldn't do this with either tool independently. So you've got to use them together to make this happen. Now, that was a lot of steps. There's a lot going on there. <clears throat> Excuse me. George Hatch has kindly written this up on the uh, blog post. He, he's written up a blog post on this. It's over on the community site. Remember, autodesk.com. Inforks 360 community, and you can get to it there. So if you want the details step by step, but that's a great workflow for communicating that early design as part of the process. All right, Jerry, let's take a look at one of the questions you've got while I am loading up the next proposal to look at this. Uh, why do you prefer a raster? So why do I prefer a raster of the contours as opposed to grabbing contour line work and importing them uh, to Inforx 360? Uh, just really a couple of different ways to skin the cat. Um, I could take the SDF out. Um, I do like having the raster version. And that raster piece really lets me use different colors and different line types, different colors, different pieces. So let me take a, let me go back to that real quick. Let's look at this. Um, one of the things you'll notice is that in here, in the raster version, I've got color differentiation between major and minor. Now, to do that using an SDF file, I would either have to use some rules, some themes, or I would have to export out different sets of GIS data. Right? And then I could bring them in as different data sources and color them differently. Um, yeah, I mean, that's workable, but it's a bit of a pain in the butt, to be honest. The other thing is, if I've got a AutoCAD site plan that has hatching and footprints and blocks and just all those other different pieces, being able to merge line work into a raster and then bring it all in as a single image in Inforks is a little bit easier to manage. All right, let's take a look at my drainage. We're just going to do it in this one uh, to go forward. So we're doing okay on time, I think. These tips now are all a little bit faster. One of the things you'll run into when we look at this site is that the water does drain off. It follows this creek to the northwest. And when we first started looking at this during our uh, Day in the Life seminar, we said, okay, well, let's run the drainage out. And we pull up the Create Watershed tool. And I click the little magic button here at the edge of my property, and I press enter, and it starts analyzing data. And, you know, assuming my kids aren't killing my connection with the Xbox upstairs, they should come back pretty quickly. But what you'll find is that the result in this case should probably leave you asking more questions than it answers. Because what we're going to get is a watershed that all too conveniently follows the edge of my model. And here you go. Now, that looks pretty good until you start thinking about it going, you know, there is no way that I drew the magic line in Model Builder to generate a watershed that stops right at the edge of my model. It's just, it's just not possible. But I've done so much work in this at this point. You know, I've, I've done some layouts, and, you know, if we looked at some of my other proposals, I've got lots, I've got roads. How, how can I add to this without blowing up what I've got? 
And there's a couple of ways to go at it, but my favorite way is to actually start from the top. So I'm going to jump back to the home screen. And what I do is I simply go rerun Model Builder on a bigger area. John was, you know, John was looking at the site. John, when he created the initial model, was looking at the site. He was looking at, you know, uh, a half mile in any direction. For hydrology, often we have to look for miles in any direction, right? We've got to have models that are 10, 15, 20, 50 square miles. We've got to be able to actually see where does the hydrology end. And so what you're seeing here is the same site. You know, and there's our little subdivision. We looked at that before. But now if we zoom way back, you'll see that we've got way more model to play with. And I just ran the same sort of calculation to see if I caught the edge of the watershed in a way that made more sense. And this is what you see. Right, so there's my little creek. And now you can see that watershed and where it truly breaks. Now, how am I gonna take this information and bring it into my original model? Well, I'm actually gonna round trip it. And I'm gonna take this model and I'm gonna round trip this into Civil 3D. So the way to do this is to go ahead and close that model. And let's just go ahead and switch back and we'll come back to this one in a second. And let's take a look at this inside of Civil 3D. So now we're going to take a look at, and I'm gonna open up the file. We're not gonna go through the import in forks dialog. We're just going to open up this drawing. Now this drawing that you're seeing here, this is the entire, or this is the larger area. So here's our site right here in the middle of the screen. You can sort of see the standard, the, the road layout we had from last time. But now I have imported in a larger area that reflects well beyond the limits of where that drainage area was. So it's a little bit um, counterintuitive, but to get data, more data into InfoWorks for Model Builder, I actually take it to Civil 3D, and then I simply grab that surface, and I bring it back into InfoWorks. So now we have this large area, and when we bring it back into InfoWorks, let's go ahead and take a look at now my watershed model or my watershed proposal, now you can see the larger area. You can see those larger uh, watersheds and how they break and where they break in the middle and sort of collect and those sorts of things. And you can also see where I was picking up and I was doing some work on this culvert. But by bringing that surface back in, and we brought it in just by dragging and dropping a data source back in. If we take a look at my terrain here, you'll see that this is that USGS DEM surface. I did it with Land XML because that's the way I roll. You could do it with contours. You could do it with a raster. You could do, I mean, as long as you get that terrain data, you could just bring in that Civil 3D DWG. That's fine. I like Land XML because it compartmentalizes the data, right? It's a snapshot in time. If something happens, if somebody deletes that file, whatever. I'm probably still going to have that land XML file floating out on my network, and I can bring that in directly. It makes it very easy. Now, the other thing you'll notice when you do this trick is that the aerial image now does uh, stop, but you can fix that simply by opening up the imagery. Now, let's talk about one thing because I, I, I'm skipping over a step here. When I look at my model settings or my model properties, one of the things you have to do is define and edit the area of interest, right? So my first version of that model, the area of interest, only ran where the aerial photo was. I have to grab the area of interest and make it larger so that that surface will come in. Then when I bring that in, if I go back to imagery, double click the imagery that we got from Bing, then I can actually close and refresh, and it will paint the entirety of that model. Oh, let's get it to launch. 
it will, if I close and refresh, it will download the entire new extent of my model and it will paint all of that silly putty with Aerial Photo. Now, to some extent, I don't care. I'm using the terrain for hydrology. I'm not using the terrain for display purposes. So I don't ever do it, but you can do it. The other nickel tip I'll throw in there for those of you who are uh, users and frequent users is that if you go to the raster source page coming out of Model Builder by default, and let's move this up just a little bit so you guys get a better look just in case my screen is shrinking. By default, Model Builder pulls in a tile level 17, which equates to about a three and a half foot to a four foot pixel, depending, you know, I guess 1.1 meter, you get the idea. For all of the U.S., you can always, almost always, up this to tile level 19, and that equates to a one-foot pixel, approximately. Now, when you do that, it's going to take a while, right? We're not just going from four to one. We're going from four squared to one squared. So you're actually going to increase the data volume 16 times. Don't make this change five minutes before you got to present. I typically go from 17 to 19 when I'm walking out to lunch, just to give you some sort of sense of time involved here. But it does give you that higher level aerial imagery from Bing. You can get that one foot pixel over most of the US uh, and it varies throughout the rest of the world. Let's pull up a question while I switch to my other proposal. Go ahead, hit me. Raster, wait, you saw, I already answered that one. Talking about contours. You have another one? Uh, recommendation for smoothing between surfaces of different quality. Um, Smoothing between surfaces of different quality is is tough. I mean, let's be honest, right? You're going to go out, you're going to send a survey crew out. That guy's going to pick up probably 16 decimal places of accuracy. Uh, he's going to bring back a survey that is elevation to two or three decimal places. USGS is you know, a 30-foot grid. It's going to have some gaps. There's going to have some rough edges. The way I do it um, is I actually go and, and I take the Infworks USGS uh, DEM. I take it to Civil 3D. I take the surveyed surface and then what I do is I paste both of those into a composite surface. So I paste in the USGS first or shuttle cons, whatever. I paste in the Infoworks big scale surface first. I paste in my survey surface and then I go back to the original surveyed surface and I extract the border. I extract the border. I extract the area where the two surfaces should align. And then what I do is I offset that 25 feet in either direction so that I get a 50 foot wide donut around my surveyed data. And then I take on my composite surface, I run the Krieging surface smoothing on the area inside the donut, on the area in between, in that 50 foot buffer, I run natural neighbor smoothing and interpolation. Now, that's gonna give you some funky results. It's gonna give you better than the sharp edges that you'll get if you just place them directly. You know, my hope is that if you are surveying, you're giving yourself enough survey outside the actual area of interest that a 25 or 50 foot buffer doesn't cause you to lose sleep at night but you can adjust that buffer however you are. So I use those surface manipulation tools in Civil 3D to smooth those areas between the two, and then I bring them back into Enforce for Display. All right, let's move on and look at another workflow using Civil 3D data inside of Enforce and how we can make this a little bit better. So here's our final design. This is the full set of construction documents. You can see I've got surfaces, galore going on here. I probably need to do some rebuild. I've got alignments. I've got parcels. I've got pipe networks. I've got core. I've got a lot going on. And if I try and use it all, it sort of overwhelms my brain. 
but I really need to create a nice exhibit showing a final design. Now, I typically start using a parcel to SDF just going from Civil 3D. And let's talk about how we do this. So let's go to the Home tab here. And then I go in to my Output tab, and I use the Export Civil Objects to SDF because that's how I get parcels. That SDF, that spatial data file, gives me the Civil 3D parcels that I can then bring into Inforks, and I get these really nice, you know, shapes. I get these pieces that I can display in whatever manner I like. I can stroke the outside of the parcel so that I get a lot plot plan. I can get just the gray. I mean, this looks just like um, the Prismacolor exhibit that my office used to kick out on almost a daily basis for subdivision building. If I want to go to the next step, though, I really want to get that more detailed, that final design. I want to show things like the green belt, the sidewalk, the back of curb, the paving, all those sorts of things. And the best way to do that is to use the corridor. Now, if I use the corridor and I try and use the Civil 3D roads, though, I get some weirdness between the interaction of the roads and the intersections and how my final design works. So in my case, I only use parts of it. So let's take a look at that. And I'm going to drag and drop in the same way we did before the final design DWG, the one we were just looking at, drag and drop that in. And I need to tell it, though, that this is a civil 3D drawing and tell it OK. And the trick here is to not click close and refresh. Just tell it OK. So we're going to bring in all of my surfaces, all the align, all that stuff that's in that civil 3D drawing is available to me in Inforks, and that's great, but really, I just want parts of it. So I just do OK, and then I ignore parts of it. First thing I want, though, is I'm going to use this coverage area coming from my corridor, right? So the corridor has materials assigned through the code set style. And if we just open up that corridor coverages and click close and refresh, you'll see I get a better painting of the sidewalks, the roads, all those sorts of things. Now, I get some interesting things in the overlap areas where I've got some swale, where I've got some grading. And really what you're looking at, though, as we highlight, if you'll take a look, is that we get coverage areas that are easy to manipulate generally. So we grab this, for example. Now, I have turned on the preview pane, the preview functionality, to get this card set here. If you're on 2016.4, let's talk about this preview because I want you to go home and experiment with it. On the Home tab, on the Home screen. Over on the right-hand side, you'll see all the preview technology that we're making available to you. One of those things is this idea of the contextual stack. That's what that is. That's that stack of information. It's essentially, uh, it's like a contextual ribbon, right? It shows me a stack of data that only makes sense in context. So for this piece, when I pick that, it shows me all the things about that. And one of the things it shows me is the ability to change the rule style right from there and that's going to redraw and it's going to bring me back my property line because I have removed the rule that was coming from the corridor so there's a little bit of manual cleanup here on mine now if you are doing this work and you are a smart engineer you're an expert civil 3d user right what you'll do is you'll go set the texture on your code set style for your slopes to not exist. You'll say none. And then when it comes in, it'll just be transparent, even though it's driving that area. Now, this is all fine and good, but it's still flat, right? It's not a road yet. So what other piece do we need? We need that corridor surface. So let me go to my data sources and take a look at my final design. And I like the corridor surface. And hopefully I picked the right one here. And if I didn't pick it, we'll get it right in a second. And I pick close and refresh. And now I get that really nice 
back of curb surface, I got the slope, I got the shadows, I got the road grade. This all comes across, and now I've got a real cul-de-sac instead of just that dummy terminal at the end of the area. This really looks like the beginning of a neighborhood now. So it's a workflow using data from Civil 3D, using that corridor, using those code sets to drive display and texture and surface in in Forks 360. It is chocolate and peanut butter in the best way. All right, let's look at the last thing I want to look at, and we're going to look at a couple of animation tricks that uh, you don't have to be a, a, an animation or visualization expert to take advantage of. So while I'm loading up my other model, Jerry, any other questions pop up that we need to take a look at? All right, looks pretty clean. I'll keep an eye over on that other window just in case. So this is uh, Manchester, city of Manchester. This is a uh, quick model, so you can see uh, we've got uh, Emirates Stadium up on the far right. You've got Old Trafford in the middle for those of you who are soccer fans. And then we have the Monday morning commute nightmare down here in the bottom scene. So let's take a look at what typically happens on Monday morning is something like this because somebody runs a stop sign and there's a delivery truck making a turn and the guy in blue was blind and he just he just took the turn he shouldn't have and now you got police and you got congestion you got a real mess and this sort of model uh, we were working with a customer how could they produce a video of this and you know it's really easy to get into modeling and get into the storyboard and start looking at different options so one of my favorite tricks though we're gonna look at two things one how can we create an animation on the absolute cheapest possible way to show the phasing of the improvements at this intersection so we can look at here we're closing off the left hand lane and then in phase two we're going to close off the right hand lane to give the other road a free left and then at the end of the project we're looking at essentially a signalized intersection and this company wanted to say okay that's really that's really all we have to show for sort of conceptual project presentations what's the fastest and easiest way to show it well the fastest way I like to show it is to simply take a snapshot of each proposal from the same perspective. Just use the Create Snapshot tool. When you create the snapshot tool, what you'll get is a stack of images. And so we take a look at my desktop. And if we pull this over, you can see I just get these snapshots that come from that single that single perspective and if you then use those you can actually create the and this is we're going to jump back to PowerPoint because it's sort of funny let's just resume our slideshow this is we talk about the hammer and then we talk about the sledgehammer PowerPoint is my tack hammer right by using the same snapshot take it from the same bookmark I can create a transition in PowerPoint that walks people through and they understand the project. I mean, that is the absolute world's easiest animation. I drop five images in PowerPoint, I make them line up on the screen, and then I do a fade transition. It's simple, it's effective. My grandmother understands how that intersection is going to change and what the process is going to be like. Very cool, very simple, very effective you could do this today now if you want to do something a little more complex one of my favorite tricks is to set up a single storyboard for multiple proposals so let's go again back to let's go back to uh, Monday morning right and I've added in a single simple storyboard where I just spin the camera around the intersection I just used an orbit I did it for 360 degrees and I did it for 10 seconds. It's really very simple. And then if you take that animation 
and you go through each proposal, each phase, each scheduled timeline, whatever it may be, and do the same thing, you'll see that you can then have essentially five videos from the same camera perspective and you can stack them up. Now, at that point, it's really a question of what do you wanna do with the tools? Now, I use Camtasia, we use Camtasia here a lot. So what I did is I simply took those videos, all five of them, into Camtasia. And let me bring this over onto my screen. And hopefully this will uh, play back okay. But just by splicing in between those different proposal videos, I get a 360 spin of my intersection showing the construction timeline from two lanes today to signalized in six months or whatever that timeline may be. It's a really simple, effective way to use the animation and camera tools and the storyboard tools to convey design intent. All right, we jumped through a lot of different things. Let me stop this here. Let's go back to PowerPoint for a second. Let's resume our slideshow. We looked at creating that model and we looked at bringing contours in from Civil 3D. We talked a little bit about the uh, why we used raster instead of line work and thank you Justin Brown for the great question. We looked at how can we expand the InfoWorks surface using Civil 3D and how we could smooth those intersections or those interactions between survey data and US data, USGS data. And we talked about using the Civil 3D surface smoothing tools to do that. We looked at, um, wow, surface smoothing drainage. Uh, and we looked at creating an animation uh, a little bit easier perhaps. Now, that's not really a civil 3D workflow, but it's a great, great little tip and trick if you want to put, spit something out this afternoon that makes your boss go wow. So we've done a lot all in the space of 50 minutes. We've got the next webcast is in just two weeks. Again, it'll be my buddy Nick Zeban and Nigel Peters. I want to thank you all very much for joining me today on this webcast. Let me thank Jerry and Jeff for uh, taking and being part of the draftees in the background. I'll answer a couple of last minute questions, but uh, if you want to drop off, thank you again for joining us today. There was one question, uh, how did I get smooth arcs in parcels from Civil 3D as SDF? Um, it may be my uh, one of my settings for arc segment length. Uh, I'll have to check. I don't think I changed anything uh, in my settings. Um, you may want to follow up with our support team. You should be getting arcs when you export that SDF and put it into Inforks. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great Wednesday, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Goodbye.